Welcome back to Long Prime Daily, everybody. For this story, we're going to go to the West Coast, where a podcaster and her husband were killed in Redmond, Washington, apparently by an obsessed fan. It happened early Friday morning. Police say a stalker broke into Zori Sedegi's home through her mother's window. The mother managed to get away, but the gunman, Raman Kodakor Ramarzai, killed Sedegi and, his hu and her husband, Malad Nasseri. He then turned the gun on himself. Police say the suspect started listening to Sedegi on the platform Clubhouse, where she streamed a show in Farsi about getting a job in the tech industry. She and the suspect apparently became friends, but his actions became increasingly concerning, so she eventually got a no-contact order. In fact, according to paperwork, he had harassed her by phone for months, sometimes calling 100 times a day. He also harassed her husband and sent gifts to her home, even showing up once to deliver them in person. Police granted the protection order, but because the suspect is a long-haul trucker, they weren't able to find him to serve the paperwork before the murders. I would just remind uh, the public that a restraining order is uh, simply a piece of paper that allows officers to uh, take enforcement action should a suspect violate uh, the court order, but a piece of paper does not protect a, a person when someone is intent on causing them harm. The, the message to them is, just in this case, as this victim did, to work closely with investigators to allow us to seek that restraining order so we can take enforcement action should a suspect violate it. But I do not want to create a false sense of security just because a restraining order or a protective order is obtained, that that is uh, you know, some type of shield that it is important for them to report each and every violation of that court order so that we can actually, uh, so that the prosecutor can then actually bring that uh, person forward for justice based upon violating that court order. In this case, the victim did everything that they possibly could. Unfortunately, this person, you know, broke into their home and, and, and killed her. And it, it is a, a tragic event. It's such a sad story. Terry, reignites the conversation. What's the process for obtaining a protective order? Well, you know, in this instance, Washington State has different types of protective orders. They have domestic violence. They have harassment. This was a stalking protective order. And what the petitioner does is they file this petition and they allege that the respondent was stalking them. And they can, if the court allows it, get a temporary restraining order. And then there's a hearing to determine whether or not there should be a permanent restraining order. And once you get it, one of the things you have to do is to make sure that you report any type of infraction on that protective order, just as you heard the officer there state, because it's really important that they follow up. And also, once you get it in the state of Washington, it is enforceable in any other state in the country. So that's one good thing. You don't have to continue filing these protective orders if you decide to move. Yeah, Brian, so there's an order of protection put in place here. How did things escalate with two people dead? It, far too quickly. And I'm, I kind of want to focus on what the officer said there in that interview. I get what he's saying. It's a piece of paper. It's much like a, a, a stop sign. People can choose to abide by it or not. But I do believe there could have been greater help by the police to ensure their safety. A hundred phone calls delivering packages. I mean, oftentimes I'm on the other side. I'm the defense attorney saying, hey, this order of protection is not necessary. The person wants to go home and see their child because it's between two spouses or whatever it may be. But this seemed pretty clear cut. There probably should have been a protective order along with a protective detail by police officers ensuring that this person wasn't coming over and over again. It seems like they fell short of protecting this woman in, they could have done more even though she did everything she could. Yeah, I think he, he said it best. It's everyone's worst nightmare in these kinds of stalking situations. Well, there is another brutal killing that's making headlines this time in Minnesota. Deputies say a father killed an elderly sex offender using a shovel and a moose antler. Deputies say Levi Axtell showed up at the sheriff's office drunk and covered in blood admitting to the murder. He says he used the shovel to hit Lauren Scully, a known sex offender, 15 to 20 times. He said he then finished him off with a large moose antler. Axtell claims Scully stalked his two-year-old daughter back in 2018. He says that Scully would park his van and watch the child go on walks near her daycare. An order of protection was granted for a few weeks and then ultimately dismissed. For now, Axtell is being held without bond as he awaits an April court date. Shared stories of prison breaks, high-speed chases, fugitives on the run, but our next suspect out of Utah apparently wanted to go to prison. That's right. 65-year-old Donald Matthew Santa Croce handed a Wells Fargo bank teller a note last week. The note said, quote, please pardon me for doing this, but this is a robbery. Please give me $1. Thank you. 
The teller gave Santa Croce a $1 bill and then asked him to leave, but he told the bank teller to call police and then sat in the lobby until they arrived. He handed responding officers the $1 bill and asked to be jailed in federal prison. Unfortunately for Santa Croce, he wasn't sent to federal prison and instead was booked in the Salt Lake County Jail on a robbery charge. Terry, I don't know about this one. What do you think is going to go on here? I mean, why would someone ask to be sent to federal prison? I don't get the advantage there. You know, we have seen that federal prison is better than state prison. I don't know why anyone would want to commit a crime and go to prison, but I'm thinking, listen, he is 65 years old and he will get food, he will get shelter, and that may have been part of what was going on there, which is a bad, sad, sad, you know, reflection on society today. And it's happened before. We know in 2011 in North Carolina, a very similar situation occurred. There was another bank robbery for a dollar and the man wanted to go to prison as well and you know it happened in California and in all of these cases it's a person who doesn't have a lot and who is looking to get shelter and medical care so it really does reflect on society and I think it really is something that needs to be addressed in the entire system one thing I'll add is you can't decide whether you go to federal or state and so it's no federal crime here there was no violation of a federal statute there was no violation of the Constitution so he went to county jail which is oftentimes nowhere near as nice as <laughs> if you can call it nice is nowhere near safe and the food is better so people if they have to go would rather go to federal court it feels a little bit like the Shawshank Redemption I think the character was Brooks who wanted you know to go back to prison and look I think the details will surround about why why that might have been. I want to ask Brian a legal question here. No gun, no threats. We know robbery kind of you need that kind of uh, that level of threat or intimidation or force. How is this a robbery? So yes and no, you, you need that level of threat. I think when most people when they hear robbery, they think of the typical bank robbery that you see on TV and they're coming in and it's like, catch me if you can, coppers and they're running out, guns are blazing. But you actually don't need that in most states and especially in this state as well. So the ones you're thinking about in terms of robbery, use of force or fear of, in, of immediate use of force. So gun or a shooting or just saying, hey, I got a gun, I wanna rob you. But there's also another point of, of robbery as well, and that's wrongful appropriation. It is wrongful for you to go to a bank and take money that is not yours. You're, you're taking it from them even though you're not using force or the threat of that force. So I think that this is robbery. Where I've seen it in New York is the aggressive panhandler. The panhandler keeps saying, hey, give me a dollar, give me a dollar, give me a dollar, give me a dollar. They're not holding up with a gun, but that aggression and maybe a little bit of fear is why you give that dollar. That can be considered a form of robbery, even though I argue it all the time that it's not. Yeah, and they could say, look, he, he said it's a robbery. This is a complete stranger. Maybe we felt a little uneasy, so I can see how they could try to make out the case. Terry Bryant, thank you so much. Everyone out there, thanks for joining us here on Long Crime Daily. We're going to see you next time as we discuss justice in America.